Hello, fellow rebel capitalists. Hope you're well. So in the news today, we've got some Russia, United States, oil, oil price cap, all of these things. And then I want to explore an idea that is, is pretty straightforward and obvious, but I haven't, I was surprised when I read this article, I hadn't given it a lot of thought. And this, this is definitely something I believe should be on your radar when we're trying to predict what will most likely happen with the global economy going into 2023. So let's just get right over to this article from Zero Hedge. We've got oil jumps after Russia threatens to cut output in response to price cap. So I think what we're going to see or what we could see moving into 2023 and maybe unfortunately into 2024, maybe 2025 is this kind of cold war between the West and Russia, maybe the BRIC countries, nations, in in, in terms of using energy as a kind of a, a proxy war. So you've got uh, Russia saying, okay, well, we don't like what you're doing, so we're going to do X, Y, and Z to energy. And then the United States and the West is saying, well, Russia, we don't like what you're doing, so we're going to do A, B, and C. And it's just this, this, it's basically a pissing match and going back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. But unfortunately, what they're using is the most com precious commodity that we have on the face of the earth. And this is oil or maybe more broadly speaking, energy. So right here, going back to this Zero Hedge article, so kind of tit for tat here, the West comes out and says, okay, we'll do this price cap, which as you guys know, is just completely ridiculous. But then Russia, they say, well, we got to do something. So we're going to go ahead and push back and we're going to reduce output by 500,000 barrels a day to 700,000 barrels a day in response to the cap. And this is what Deputy Prime Minister Alexander Novak is saying, according to their state-run kind of news agency. It's called TASS. So according to TASS, they're quoting this uh, Deputy Prime Minister guy, and he's saying that he's speaking on behalf of the Kremlin, that in response to this ridiculous price cap from the West, they're going to reduce output by 500 to 700,000 barrels a day. While not formalized, okay, well, I guess President Putin uh, needs to sign it to make it actual law. Uh, a risk on sentiment and weaker dollar helping the price of oil. So this is one thing that I want to explore here in this video. It's very, very, very important. And I, I'm, I'm actually surprised that I haven't... Uh, than like a whiteboard video on this topic specifically, but maybe next week that would be a good thing to discuss. So of course, as the war grinds on, uh, traders have been waiting for Moscow full response to the cap, a policy that imposed $60 a barrel ceiling on Russian crude. Uh, of course, they're just gonna sell it to someone else. I, I always use the example of you going down to your local gas station where gas is $4 a gallon and saying, well, I'm, I'm not willing to pay more than three. Okay. Good luck with that. And so that's kind of what we're doing. I think you know, mostly this is political theater, in my opinion, but unfortunately this political theater has costs. And as you guys know, from watching my video, the people that are going to bear those costs most likely are going to be the poor and middle class. Uh, speak And speaking of prices, uh, WTI rose more than $2 on the news, while Brent above 83 despite pervasive global recession fears. Yeah, so this is kind of the back and forth that's going on in the oil market right now at the price. Uh, you definitely have supply constraints, but then people are looking at the demand side of the equation and saying, well, okay, how much is demand going to go down? And how much is that going to impact the price if we do go into a significant recession in 2023? Keeping in demand, keeping in mind that uh, demand for energy obviously is far more inelastic than 
demand for other products. So my point in bringing up this article, now we're talking about Biden and the politically mandated SBR, SPR drain. They're doing that to try to bring prices down, um, buying votes, basically what that amounts to, and at the expense of putting us in what could be a compromising position if we were to engage with uh, Russia, obviously, hopefully we don't, or we could have some sort of other crisis situation. It doesn't necessarily have to be World War III where we would need this SPR. So they're putting it, they've put us in a precarious position. I think you guys know that. And um, this is kind of what Zoltan Pozar was talking about the other day when he was saying that maybe Russia in an indirect way will sell their oil to Biden for grams of gold in order to get this SBR filled up at a potentially cheaper price. But uh, that's, I guess, a topic for a completely separate discussion. But what this shows, in my opinion, is that we're kind of now in this proxy war and we're with the Russia, maybe even the BRIC nations. I'm talking about we the West. And uh, right in the middle of this is, and what we're using for that proxy war is energy. And this is dangerous. This is very dangerous because energy is just so vital to modern life. I mean, well, energy is vital to life, period. <laughs> you go back as far as you want, and it still revolves around energy. But um, we're just playing with fire here. And it's just this political posturing on both sides, um, with Russia, with the BRIC countries, with the West. And uh, what this will most likely lead to, although it's very volatile, but over the long run, most likely lead to shortages, uh, supply chain disruptions, and, uh, and, and, and scarcity, which will most likely drive the price up, which again, disproportionately impacts the poor and, and middle class. But I don't know that this kind of oil energy proxy war, if you will, I don't know that this ends quickly. Obviously, I wish it would, but I definitely see it moving into 2023 and into 2024. After that, it's anybody's guess. But I think this is something that we're going to have to deal with for at least the next couple of years. All right, so now let's go over to this other article that I was that I just pulled up in in, in just going over the zero hedge post, and um, this is really fascinating. Uh, I'm not sure the gentleman who wrote this. His name is Phil. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm not sure who he is. Phil Verliger in Denver, and this was published November eight. 2022, and this is on energyintel.com. Really interesting article. Oil and the dollar, the new relationship. Because you always hear there's this inverse relationship between oil and the dollar. And you're like, yeah, oil's priced in dollars. But but is there always an inverse relationship? And if so, why? You know, I was, I was tr I'm trying to think that through. Because as you guys know, from my willingness to go after sacred cows, I'm always trying to take things that we just assume to be true and maybe poke holes in it so I can understand if it is true, why? I don't want to just accept the fact that this is true. I want to understand why it's true. And maybe, you know, maybe that's why I started the YouTube channel. Maybe that's why I continue to do it after three years is it's just always in an effort to try to understand how things work. I just, I don't, I, I find it very hard to have someone just tell me, oh, the oil market works like this without just me saying, okay, well, maybe it does, but l let me think this through. Let me truly, truly understand it. And if there's something there that doesn't make sense to me, I I'm, I'm not just going to shrug my shoulders and say, oh, well, this doesn't make sense, but that guy said it's true. So I'm just going to forget about it and go on with my life 
and I'm not, I'm just going to assume that it is like, I, I can't do that. <laughs> and I wish I could, I wish I could. But uh, so anyway, in trying to think through, you know, why, why, why is this correlation there? And obviously lately it has not been there. And so if it hasn't been there lately, why? And, and what changed and what impact does that have on maybe the global economy going into 2023? So uh, today's rising oil prices, now I'm reading the article, today's, today rising oil prices are associated with a strengthening dollar, whereas rising oil prices once caused the dollar's exchange rate to decline. Rise, rising, see, and I don't, I, I need to really, that's what I need to dig into deeper. But anyway, I don't want to get stuck on that in this article. Rising U.S. oil, nat gas, food exports, as well as market disruptions caused by the war in Ukraine explain the change in the fundamental linkage. Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's keep going here. Not sure I fully agree with that, but uh, the consequences for countries that depend on imports, food, energy, as well as nations that rely primarily on oil gas exports could be profound. This is where I agree completely, completely agree with this. So let me just read that one more time here. And now he's talking about the oil and uh, about oil and the dollar going up at the same time. The consequences for countries that depend on imports for food and energy i.e. you have to settle with dollars, as well as nations that rely primarily on oil and gas exports could be profound. Yeah. So then he shows this chart of, uh, let's see, the BIS. Oh, this is from the, okay, Bank of International Settlements, U.S. dollar exchange rate dated Brent price from 2009 to 2021. So it looks like the uh, trend is, oh, 2009 to 2016. Oh, I get it. So this is the correlation that we saw between 2009 and 2016, and then how that correlation broke. And I'm talking about the inverse correlation between the price of oil and, uh, uh, and the dollar on, as measured by the DXY. And then now we see that uh, correlation break here in 2021 and 2022. That's basically what this chart is telling us. And it, he says his research, research shows that this negative correlation uh, goes all the way back to at least 1980. So 1980 to 2022. And he points that out further with this graph. But now I think the main point that I want to discuss is the fact that this is broken. So we can't say definitively that there's always an inverse relationship. And so how does this impact the countries that are involved? Well, this is actually kind of part of Brent's dollar milkshake theory, but it's it, it, it makes it even more powerful from the standpoint of if you are Turkey, or if you are Japan, let's say, and you're really, you've got big problems because the dollar is appreciating rapidly versus your local currency. And you need those dollars in order to buy one barrel of oil. So if you're a net importer, that puts you in a very compromising position. So just, I, I wrote down some really quick numbers, just, and, and these aren't obviously exact. Usually when I use numbers, they're not exact, unless I, I'm using a chart or something like that. Usually I'm just kind of just going through this as a, as a thought experiment so we understand the concept. So let's just assume for a moment that XYZ local currency or, or country, uh, their currency was 10 to one as far as the dollar. So $1 would equal 10 of their local currency units. Okay, and let's just assume that oil is uh, 60 bucks a barrel. So that would mean that at the beginning of this thought experiment, it would cost 600 local currency units to buy one barrel of oil. Okay, pretty straightforward. 
But let's just assume for a moment their currency goes from 10 to 1 to 20 to 1. Like we've seen a lot of currencies do, maybe not to that extent, but we've seen a lot of currencies that have gone down dramatically against the dollar over the last, call it year, year and a half. So your currency now goes from 20 to 1. Well, now all of a sudden, that barrel of oil that cost you 600 of your local currency units cost you 1,200 of your local currency units. Just, just let that sink in for a moment. I mean, if th you think the price of gas has gone up in the United States. I mean, think what, how much it would have gone up if you weren't on the dollar. Think about how much it would have gone up if not only oil prices went up, which which was part of the reason you saw, let's say, six dollars. Uh, I don't know what it was in the states. But let's assume it's like six bucks a gallon. But just think, in addition to that, if your local currency was not dollars and your local currency depreciated by fifty percent, in addition to the price of oil going up to whatever, 100 bucks a barrel, you see? So go, getting back to our little thought experiment here. So now in this example, oil costs you 1,200 of your local currency units instead of 600, but that doesn't factor in the price of oil itself denominated in dollars actually going up. So my point is you can see how very quickly you could go from 600 of your local currency units for one barrel of oil to 1,200 to 2,000 to 3,000. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Base, you could, if the oil goes from 50 bucks a barrel up to 120, I mean, wow. And then we understand that, that energy is the economy. And if we think about the fact that energy is very inelastic think about how much you'd have to rob peter to pay paul so let me put this in terms that we can all understand in the united states let's just assume for a moment that you can buy a gallon of gas for three bucks okay well now let's assume that that gallon of gas goes to six bucks. Okay. Think about how much, especially if you're like a truck driver or, you know, this, this, this is an input cost for pretty much everything that you buy. You go down to your local grocery store. Well, one of the input costs for pretty much everything you see there on the shelf is going to be gasoline or diesel. So that price doubles. So that truck driver can't just say, oh, no, I, I'm going to reduce my usage of diesel. <laughs> no, that's very inelastic. So they're going to have to either raise their prices or they're going to have to not spend money on something else. You know, like that let, truck driver, an example, saying, okay, I'm not going to service my truck because I can't afford to service my truck anymore because I've got to take all that money and allocate it to fuel, or before I didn't have to do that. Okay, so then what does that happen to the money that's going to the truck repair guy or the maintenance? Now they don't get the money. They don't have the purchasing power. Now then they have to sacrifice. They have to lay off workers. You, you see how this gets very, very complicated. And that's with gas going from three to six. Now let's assume for a moment that you're not on the dollar. And it doesn't go from three to six. It goes from three to 12. Within a span of, call it six months. I mean, just, just think about the economic devastation that would cause for an economy. And so we, as Americans, when you look at Turkey or you look at Sri Lanka or you look at all the, it, it kind of just doesn't make sense because you see it from a distance. 
But when you think about it in these terms and apply the numbers to your to your own country, I, I think you start to say, oh, wow, okay, now I get it. Now I understand what's going on in Turkey. Now I understand the social unrest. Now I understand the riots in the streets. And what does that do for the global economy? Obviously, that decreases global economic output. And then what, what does that do to the dollars, the amount of dollars that are in the system being created by the euro dollar system? What does that do to dollar liquidity? What does that do to the velocity of dollars circulating throughout the global economy? It goes down. So then what does that do to your ability to service your dollar denominated debt? See? This is obviously that that's that's Brent's take, but I think if you take an even more holistic view, or if you kind of zoom out even further to include oil, you you start to see okay, um, obviously no certainties, only probabilities, but you see how there's how the dollar unbelievably and counterintuitively could have some significant tailwind uh, behind it going into 2023. And this doesn't mean that it goes up. It just means that it might have a tailwind. Then the question becomes, okay, what's going on with interest rate differentials? And then you could layer on another variable, and another variable, and another variable, and another variable. And then you quickly start to realize why predicting which way currency will go. <laughs> <laughs> at least in the short term, is very, very difficult. But just because it's difficult, I don't think it means that we shouldn't even try or that we shouldn't even allocate mental bandwidth to trying to figure out a base case so you can layer that over your investment strategy or your view of what 2023 will most likely look like. All right, guys, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. As always, make sure that you're standing up for freedom, liberty, free market, capitalism. I want to wish you all a very happy holidays. We'll see you on the next video.